thank you for being here today. Our, our topic of the first panel is what does tokenization mean for data, Web3, and IP? And since data is one of the more important areas, tokenization, how it's protected, stored, and ultimately used and transferred, it's uh, something we'll be fleshing out uh, along with the ideas surrounding it and Web3 and what the implications are for tokenization in the new ecosystem. Our panelists are Vince Turcotte, a consultant with Cognitive GRC in the virtual asset space. Sitting next to him is Don Day, Chief Operating Officer of VDX and uh, formerly the SFC's in-house cryptocurrency and fintech person. And uh, sitting next to him is Ron Yu, co-founder of Makebell, and also uh, an adjunct professor at uh, Chinese University School of Law. And, uh, you know, you got their bios. I, I won't, I won't uh, belabor that, but uh, suffice to say, we, we have quite, quite an accomplished panel here today. So with that, I'll just dive into it, and we'll, we'll try and uh, not take too long so as to leave time for questions from the audience. I'll to turn to Vince. Vince, uh, when, when we spoke some time ago, we, we spoke about the data issues surrounding tokenization, and you know, you, you mentioned some use cases that uh, bear that out. What, what, what can you share with us? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess when you talk about issues with data and tokenization, you, it's such kind a perennial. Broad, yeah, it's a huge and very broad topic. I mean, data, of course, is the lifeblood. Of, of any financial services business, and, and uh, particularly when you're dealing in a, a market-based business um, where you may have a convergence of data from a number of different sources. Um, it becomes even more complex when you look at tokenization because you will, by necessity, be dealing with assets that have uh, pricing transparency um, in a traditional market space, um, but may, or may lack transparency in pricing in a tokenized space for a number of different reasons, which we can sort of dive into as we go along. Um, but I guess the first thing you have to think about is, you know, break it down by where you are in the transaction's life cycle. You know, whether you're on the initiation stage, are you, are you actually creating a transaction, or are you in the post-trade life cycle, uh, you know, when a, when a trade has already been done? And that's the first thing to look at. Um, each of them has their own set of nuances, and when you look in the world of a blockchain-oriented world, uh, environment, you you create yet another layer uh, of issues. So I kind of like to think of it as the, the, the overarching principle that you, you sort of have to look at is interoperability. Uh, interoperability between execution environments. So Don may list a token on, on his exchange um, that may be the only place in the world where you can find pricing for that token. Um, that price may or may not be based on uh, a real world asset, an RWA. I hate, I'm beginning to hate that term, real world assets. But, um, but it, or, or it may be a one where you know, it's listed across several different venues. So I'm just sort of trying to illustrate the complexities that are introduced by tokenization into what we've always taken for granted as a fairly straightforward environment. You turn on your, your computer, you pay for market data, the market data is there. You have uh, transparent pricing or at least level two data. Uh, what's the high, the low, and the close, for instance, on, on uh, an, an asset. Um, but you, you, know, you may have to add a whole new layer to that when you're talking about tokenized assets. So let's start with the front end of it. Um, what blockchain are we on? You know, are, we, are we working in, uh, in Ethereum? Are we working in Solana? Um, are we working in Polygon? Um, each of these, you know, has their, their separate underlying language, whether it's Rust in Solana uh, or, of course, um, Solidity uh, for, for Ethereum. Are we going to have another language on top of that? Are we going to have a compiling language like Python or, or, or something on top of that that drives it? None of these questions you need to ask when you're talking to somebody about trading in traditional financial markets. Most of these things are introduced complexities that are a product of operating in the blockchain environment. Um, one of the more interesting things that's, that's probably not in my bio, but one of the projects that I've been working on is I'm the regional head, uh, regional chair for uh, FIX, which is the financial information exchange uh, language that's been around for about 30 years. It's evolved in traditional finance. But I'm on the, the, 
the uh, co the co-chair for Asia for the um, uh, the the blockchain aspect of that for for digitizing that that data. And what we found is that we can take the uh, everything that we can do, of course, in traditional assets. Um, on the transaction side, we can assign a fixed code to it and we can produce a data frame that looks roughly like it would look uh, if we were taking it out of a traditional environment. But then underneath that, there are two more layers. So you start looking at what's called a DTI, the uh, digital token identifier, and the, the other two layers are what venue is it trading on? Um, it, is it unique to that venue? And then the third layer below that is what blockchain is it trading on? And so you have to have all these things in mind, rather than just when you look at, at, at uh, standard fix for, um, you know, for instance, for traditional assets, you're only talking about the ISN or I, ISIN number, uh, the International Securities Identification Number. That's what your security is, or a QSIP number in the case of some fixed income securities. For, you know, for a, a blockchain transaction, you have the other two layers as well. So we're finding that we have to coordinate all of this with a number of, with a veritable alphabet soup. I mean, I'll, I can run through a couple of them. I've already mentioned FIX, but there's the, uh, the DTCC CTM database, which we'll talk about a little bit later for another reason. Um, there's the uh, uh, ISDA, the International Swap Dealers Association uh, CDM database. Um, and then of course, everything has to come up under ISO uh, 24165, which is the international data standards. Um, you can't talk to anybody without having all of those things aligned. So we're at the very beginning of this process. This isn't something that is racing ahead in leaps and bounds. You know, when we, we look at the literature um, that's out there about tokenized assets, individual tokenized assets, you, you get the idea that it's all happening fast and you better get on the train right now. But if you, let's take an example for United States Treasury securities that have been tokenized so far. The number is like 685 million which won't even get you a quarter of a two-year issue you know, that's coming up in the, in the refunding. So it's still tiny, it's still not scaled. And the reason it's not scaled is because it doesn't have the type of standardization that will allow for liquidity across various platforms for trading or that will allow for liquidity in settlements. And, you know, and I, I could, I mean, <laughs> this is one of Don's favorite topics I know, but when we get onto it, we'll talk a little bit about custody. And, you know, and, and what you need to do to have uh, an integrated custody solution. If I trade, um, we'll stick with the example of the United States Treasury Securities. It's pretty straightforward. I would go through DTCC, um, you know, my custodian, whether I chose it to be State Street or uh, Bank of New York or somebody like that, would have accounts set up there in my name. And all of that would be handled in a pretty straightforward fashion. If I'm going to set up a, a similar arrangement and do it in a tokenized fashion, the state of the, of the market right now is I have to have an account and a custody solution that is specifically designed for the exchange that I trade on. And if I have 50 different venues, and that's not an exaggeration, I may need 50 different venues, I need 50 different accounts. I need 50 different uh, uh, settlement structures and settlement instructions that I have to deal with. So as you can see, again, it's like, you know, the promise is there. I mean, all of the things that we hope for in terms of, of reduced settlements friction, in terms of, of uh, market transparency, and of course the, the history and auditability of a blockchain transaction, all those things exist. But right now they exist only on the whiteboard and in various projects that are just getting off the ground. So we'll get there. Um, but in terms of data, I think, you know, I think if, if anything, I hope I've created a whole bunch of questions. Um, and I, I don't have any ready solutions to offer, even though I'm actively engaged in an international standards committee that is busy trying to set this up. We're not there yet. You know, we're not there yet. We're, we're getting there. And I, I think that, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, and I'll yield with this, but we do have a, a, a pro forma document for the transaction side. Um, we are able to uh, get uh, one of, of, of the larger exchanges in the space has 150 different customers that have asked them to write to fix for the settlement side. You know, so uh, we know that the demand is there for standardization. Um, and we know that, 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 that more and more of that is coming. Um, but that has to be driven centrally by industry bodies, um, by academics, uh, you know, by people who are coming out into the space, um, and certainly by, by the legal side as well. Um, where there will be a compulsion to line up under an ISO standard 
that is there then again aligned with each of these other uh, uh, types of databases. So that's, that's the opening salvo. I mean, John, what would, what would you guys have to say about this? As usual, I couldn't have said it better than Vince. Um, I, I think the, the, the issue is not only data related. So you're absolutely right. A, a, lot, of, um, a lot has been written about tokenization. Um, 2017, I co-founded one of the first institutional grade hedge funds for, in the crypto space, and we had a whole slide on the tokenization of assets because that's a catchy phrase. You can easily talk to investors and, and make a story around that. Um, and that was 2017. Um, there's, there's a place called the Zug Valley in Switzerland, and all of the entities there are all about the tokenization of assets. But nothing really substantial has happened. And, and like you said, people report certain numbers and, and volumes, and you compare them to volumes that are traded daily in the FX or especially in the FX market, of course, but also in the fixed income market, and they just pale to what goes on there. So, um, and we'll, we'll come to that later. Um, the devil is in the detail. There's a lot of steps that still need to be figured out. Um, they're usually not the sexy parts, but usually the nuts and bolts parts in terms of legal requirements, in terms of structure. You started to mention um, how you would do custody of an underlying asset, and you still have to do that. If you tokenize a bond, and we'll come to that later as one of my examples, it doesn't mean you don't need the bond anymore. It's just another medium that you use to trade it. So um, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of issues, um, including data, but also above and beyond data. I mean, not, not being a techie myself, but... Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Not being a techie myself, um, and being a, you know, given that my background's more compliance and regulation, but 50 different accounts across 50 different exchanges, 50 different ways of settlement. I'm thinking more bureaucratic rigmarole, more compliance burden, more, more paperwork, data, information, overflow. I, I can give you a real world example. I mean, the last firm that I was with full time, um, we were doing market surveillance. And um, market surveillance, for those of you who, who don't know, uh, involves monitoring the activity of a trading desk or activity at the level of an exchange to make sure there's no bad actors, there's nobody spoofing the price, there's nobody uh, who is creating false transactions, there's nobody who is uh, violating any rules with regards to market manipulation. Um, and we would deal with a number of firms that were engaged in the proprietary trading space, uh, so-called HFTs. And that was our roots as well. I come from that background, and, and so do the guys I work with. Um, and so we would be asked by uh, typically one of the, the household name proprietary trading firms would need to hook up to 24, 25 different crypto exchanges in order to you know, obtain the necessary liquidity that they wanted to have for cross-exchange arbitrage or for market-making activities and things like that. No two of those exchanges, when we would do all the data handling for them, we would bring it in and consolidate the data and, and put it into a single format and return it to them in that, in that fashion. No two of those exchanges uh, would supply data with the same structure. No two of them. Now, that's, that's also true, by the way, in, 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 in the world of, of uh, let's say, standard exchanges. You have, uh, the ICE exchanges, including New York Stock Exchange. You'll have the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. You'll have uh, various other stock exchanges, for instance, around the world. Um, but, and you may have, in that case, you may have a total of 20 or 25 exchanges as well, but you'll find that their data structures are much more harmonized and easier to work with. Um, they're typically formatted in FIX, the, the, language, the uh, data structure I mentioned earlier. Um, but these other, you know, the crypto exchanges are all sort of, they, own, they build their own matching engines, they have their own way of approaching data structures. Um, there's no uh, standardization or harmonization of the data in a natural way yet. Um, so some of these exchanges would bring us the data in a really nice, clean format. And we run into this, by the way, when we work with regulators too, because they need to monitor all these exchanges. So some of the exchanges were really together. They would bring their stuff with us. A great example would be CBOE Digital, 
um, they have their, their stuff tightly wired and, and they know what they're doing and they'll bring you data that you can work with right away, right out of the box. Another one, one of the very large crypto exchanges, bring you basically data in a bucket, you know, and say, you sort it out, you know, and, and, you know, and, 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 and it would be a major project in order to get that data harmonized so that it would match to the other exchanges, even with the same timestamp. So it's, you know, we spend a lot of time on the minutiae here, but it's important to understand that making that jump from traditional finance to the world of, of, of digitized finance, um, those same standards are not there. They haven't had the 30 years or so to evolve uh, that they have in the traditional financial markets. My hope is that they'll move a lot more quickly. But what that means is, is that they have, there has to be convergence to the existing structures that we have from traditional finance, not recreating the wheel. Um, anyway. So certainly harmonization seems to be a goal, um, a, a lofty goal, but I mean, it, I mean, when you say that some exchanges bring you a bucket full of data, I mean, it it's almost seems as though it's, it's akin to, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who's an accountant, some clients make their lives and your lives easier by being organized and having everything in a neat, nice neat folder, in which case you can serve them a lot more expeditiously and relatively cheaply. But the people who come to you with a stack of receipts before the filing deadline, uh, you know, yeah, the work can be done, but, but who can blame the accountant if you charge them more? Well, let me ask you this. The guys who bring you the disorganized yeah. data, are they more likely to be the ones also who have something to hide, to obfuscate? Than, than the ones point, he pointed he, than the he, and, and he, you'll, he, he concurred with that you'll find that in the world of data as well <laughs> if somebody gives me a, a very large exchange that may process as many as a hundred thousand transactions in a second gives me data that's only got millisecond granularity when I need micro at the very least in order to, to see the order of transactions they may be they maybe have something to hide they maybe don't want me to know exactly what's going on under the hood so, and, that, and, and we have found that consistently to be the case. Well, he said, I mean, a, lo a lot of those people, he said the dodgiest people gave you the shoddiest paperwork. But I mean, by the same token, there are a lot of well-organized tax dodgers who, who had, you know, immaculate paperwork, which sometimes he had to, he had to, he had to be more scrutinizing on the, on the other end with regards to that. Um, if, I, if I could actually go back to uh, something you talked about uh, and bring it to the IP area. You talked about standardization and lack of standardization. The problem in the IP area, first off, is that um, tokenizing IP as an asset, um, really, if you want to do it properly, you should actually understand the underlying nature of the asset and it's what contributes to its value, which are technological considerations in the c case of patents. Legal considerations, obviously, IP is a uh, legal right, and, some, and uh, also business considerations. Now, from the valuation standpoint, there is really not much in terms of harmonized standards. Now, there is ISO 10668, which is a, it's talked about as a trademark valuation standard. Actually, it's a brand valuation standard, okay? And as far as, um, uh, patents are concerned, there is no real standard. I mean, there are ways to value it using different methodologies. But then here comes another problem with that, is that if you want to value a patent, for example, you can provide three or four different valuations that are all different, and they're all legitimate, and they're all equally valid because you've done them with different methodologies, but you followed the methodologies and you stated your assumptions. And uh, so, so that's another problem here, is that what exactly are we, you know, you're, you're, you're tokenizing an asset that has multiple valuations, but you don't necessarily know which valuation is correct. Um, and going back to the business standpoint, um, I think a lot of the other problem, which is that you don't actually understand what your dealing with in terms of what this IP evolves. This is particularly true with patents. Patents are notoriously incomprehensible to the average person. Um, I, wrote, I wrote a patent on IP tokenization. I don't even understand my own patent. <laughs> and, um, and I can tell you that you know, it really helps if 
people can understand it. I mean, there is AI now that's helping people to understand these patents and uh, make sense of it. Um, but that is, um, that's being used right now in, in Hong Kong. But, um, you know, still, you still need to actually have some understanding of what you're dealing with, some understanding of where these apply. And in terms of valuation of the asset, um, you have to, um, in the case of IP, you have to understand that the, because it's an intangible asset, it can have multiple values all at the same time, and they can all be legitimate. Well, it's good that this brings us to the next question, which is, you know, the, the growing talk about tokenizing IP, which isn't new, but I guess the, the challenge lies in understanding IP and in intangible assets. And uh, I don't know, any, any thoughts on to, to the degree that AI can mitigate that or, or is, it, uh, is the technology not there yet? The technology is, they have been, uh, there have been people who've talked about AI and uh, using the AI to um, manage the, sorry, to help with the, let's say, trading of technology. Um, I think that's a bit um, premature, frankly speaking. In terms of uh, comprehension of IP, okay, you can actually use um, some language models um, to actually analyze and summarize a pen. Now, the problem here, however, actually lies in the way you actually prompt the machine uh, in that like if you're doing an interview, if you can ask very specific questions of the uh, interview, the person being interviewed, you can tend to get better answers, better insights. Again, here the trick is to actually um, able to prompt the AI properly such that you get the proper insights into the technology um, and that you go down, um, you get the right answers as well as the right insights that you might not get if you asked a fairly general question. Let me give you an example. All patents are classified by technology. Some patents have one or two classifications for a particular technology, sometimes multiple. But the classification, if you think about it, is just a way to put something into a, uh, a little folder and saying this is you know, part of this, uh, this, this technology falls into this category. But if you actually want to understand and go down to the, um, the nitty gritty and actually uh, understand the nuance of the technology, you actually have to understand, um, you know, to analyze the patent properly and also so that you actually get a better feel for what it actually can do. Let me give you a really grossly simplistic uh, um, example. If you are classifying vegetables. You can classify um, spinach and cabbage as vegetables, and they're both green, but really there's not much else that's similar about the two. Okay, similarly, if you put a, two patents into the same category, you can find that if you do a proper analysis, it can actually be quite, they can actually be quite different even though they are in the same technological category. So therefore, that's where the other area where AI can help is to actually find these differences. And for somebody who's not technical or not in the particular technology space, um, this is not an easy task, okay? You, so, so this AI can also help people in terms of this classification and drilling down to more specific areas of the, uh, more specific instances of the classification and more specific um, answers. I was gonna ask, you know, what excites me about your area, Ron, is that um, I'm a markets guy, you know, and I, I, I see something, you know, that's being tokenized. Um, I wanna cut it up and trade it. You know, I wanna find its value in a transparent market. Um, I wanna use it as a fundraising vehicle. You know, if I have if, if I have a, 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 a exciting group at a university, for instance, that's producing uh, a new idea, um, I want to test its worth uh, by putting it into a token structure and, and finding out if there's a market value for it. Um, and so, how far along are we in that, and, and what kind of standards are being created to do that? Okay, in terms of the market, um, there's actually a startup in Malaysia that's doing something similar. It's not actually with patents; it's actually with game IP. And really what they're doing is they're using the token as some form of, essentially as an identifier for the game IP. And then they are looking at the game statistics in terms of usage, um, um, you know, follow-ups, et cetera. And they're using that 
um, stickiness of the game, the, the attractiveness of the game, to help provide some kind of input into the funding. So in a sense, it is doing a market analysis. Um, and that is a backdoor way to get some kind of valuation. There is also another company in America um, that is doing um, IP, and what they're doing is they're uh, putting essentially a patent on an NFT and using the NFT um, as a, um, to help with the valuation. Uh, and they're getting data from other companies, uh, actually one of them's Clarity, and they're using this information to try to value the patent. Now the limitation here, however, comes down to the, the um, nature of the patent market. A lot of IP um, trading is opaque in, this, in that you may or may not know that company A has sold patents to company B or licensed patents to company B, but the amounts will be opaque. Okay, the, a lot of the valuation that this company is relying on uh, relies also on royalty data. The problem, however, is royalty data in terms of patenting, because of the opaqueness of the market, is not generally available. Okay. I put this to the panel. There's a great deal of talk in the media, and it's good that you brought up the gaming example because this nicely segues into Web3. There's a great deal of talk in the media and amongst regulators about Web3, but is this necessarily what institutions want? I mean, there seems to be a disconnect, uh, or does is Web3 such a broad umbrella categorization that it, it encompasses a great many things? You want to start, Dan? Okay. I, I, as, as we discussed uh, earlier on, I, I dislike the term Web3. Um, to me, it means everything and nothing. Um, there's obviously um, the area of, of digital assets, and, and Hong Kong is, is leading globally in terms of regulation of digital assets, of um, um, an up-and-coming institutional adoption of creating the framework and the whole value chain of, of a digital capital market that you, use, that you need. Um, so that's one area, but that area is completely different, different audience, different approach to other areas, including gaming and including NFTs and so on and so forth. So I think it would be much better to use different terms that are not trying to encompass everything that is by its very nature quite, quite separate and different. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I sort of... Um you know, I, I, I talk to a number of different people, obviously, every day. It's my job, you know, like about Web3 projects. And what the, I find that there is no single definition for, for Web3. And it depends heavily on what industry they're in. And I tend to focus quite a lot on the financial services. So I tend to gravitate towards DeFi applications. Um, you know, and that's where, where we find most of the project work I'm engaged in around Web3. But if you look at it at its, at its essence, I mean, Web3 is nothing more than uh, the creation of a number of uh, sort of a, a universe or a constellation of microeconomies. And within each of those microeconomies, uh, transactions take place on a, either with a native token or uh, with a, some other representation of value. Um, you could talk about gaming or you could talk about something that's much more tangible like, say, J.P. Morgan's Onyx platform. Um, Onyx is, is Tremendous. It's a, it, you know, most people wouldn't associate Onyx with Web3 right away, but it's ac actually exactly what it is. It's, an, it's a, a way for them to transfer value internally amongst branches and also between themselves and clients, whether that is something like an intraday repo uh, transaction uh, or a tokenized deposit. Um, and it, what it allows them to do is take advantage of all of the great things about tokenized assets. Uh, we talked about reduce settlement friction and cost, and of course, instantaneous settlement. I mean, very few people, just as a sidebar, appreciate the value of, of instantaneous settlement. Right now, the United States is scrambling to go to T plus, uh, uh, Z, T plus one for settlement, and, and the Forex world, people are literally flying their uh, staff from London to New York to relocate them, to accommodate this, rather than you know, doing some of the necessary technology upgrades that it would take, uh, which are, are by and large, much simpler if you look at it from a, with a, a blank sheet of paper, but from an institutional perspective where there are stakeholders that are just so ingrained in the existing processes, they can't conceive 
of changing the technology that they're using. Um, and that, that's really not an exa exaggeration. But taking this and then making it an external concept, um, BlackRock, they have, uh, in, uh, in, internally, um, they, they're money market funds. Uh, they, they have a setup where several of them have been tokenized. But that all happens within the confines of the Black work, uh, BlackRock you know, universe. Um, it won't be until next year that they offer this tokenized money market deposits to external clients. You know, so we're getting there. Um, but when you look at, again, when you look at the news, you think that it's happening already, we're already behind the eight ball. It's, you know, like, it, it, it really, it is and it isn't. I mean, the technology is there, um, but the will to use it is not. And, you know, I mean, with that, can I talk about my favorite uh, project? At Please. The, it, it, I, there, <laughs> There, there are a couple of things that I, there are a couple of things that these guys will always hear me talk about whenever we do panels. And um, one of them is, is in Singapore uh, where they have a, uh, a walled garden that is JP Morgan, DBS, uh, and a few other institutions uh, that is project, oh my God, I'm going to blow my, uh, I'm going to blow it, I can't remember, Guardian. Project Guardian, and Project Guardian is, is DeFi uh, protocols operating within a walled garden. It's not open to the universe, it's just open be to those institutions, and it's working. And in fact, just this week, they've signed an international agreement uh, with, with several other economies to expand the use of, of that, to trading bonds, trading foreign exchange, and so on between those names. So I take my money and I deposit it in DPS, DBS, and that they access DeFi protocols to trade with other counterparties within that universe. It's not open, it's open uh, only to those counterparties. So that's a great example of a Web3 application that is live and operating on a test scale, but it's working right now with major institutions. The other one I like talking about, and it's just been recently announced in Hong Kong, and I found out a couple weeks ago that I've been saying the word synapse wrong my entire life. Um, it's synapse according to the Hong Kong exchange. Uh, and that is the methodology that they're using for trading uh, northbound um, into, into Chinese markets. Uh, now, it, it's one option for doing that. The northbound connect has been around for a while. It, it's functional, it works extremely well, um, but it operates on a T plus zero settlement cycle. T plus zero. You know, you've got to settle it by the time the window closes at four o'clock in the afternoon, you have to have it done. And that, that's pretty amazing when you think about America scrambling to get to T plus one, you know, or, you know, or, or Europe scrambling to get to T plus three. You know, I mean, it's like, it, it is, it, the, the fact is though, that, that those are not tokenized assets. Those are just stocks that are northbound stocks, you know, all listed in China, and, but your settlement instructions have to have, you know, uh, be absolutely lucid. All of your, your market counterparts have to be, you know, uh, on point and ready to take that trade. Now what the Synapse is, is a way of using smart contracts written on a blockchain, the DAML is the language that they use, um, and you know, it, it, that facilitates the settlement process using the, I mentioned earlier, the DTCC's CTM database, which is a global custody database. They have all the information that you need to know about all the counterparties that might be germane to settlement of one of those trades. And those smart contracts operate on a blockchain alongside the settlement process without having to digitize the asset. And right there, I think, is food for thought. That raises the bar on what we really need to do to qualify something for tokenization. If you can do all this at T plus zero without having to, uh, um, without having to digitize it, what are we really talking about here when we talk about tokenization? I'll let Don do the FX example because that's even more fun. But Ron, go ahead, please. Well, actually, if I can go um, back to your original, uh, JJ's original question about Web3, um, one of the issues with uh, IP in, uh, uh, in, in the space, uh, tokenized IP in the space, is that you assume, a lot of people seem to assume that the tokenized IP is a digital twin of the actual IP, and it's not. Um, for example, um, I think one of the later panelists, um, Julian So. Uh, when I first met him, we were talking about the guy who bought the $69 million Beeple NFT, okay? And he went to Julian and said, um, what can I do with this? And Julian was like, okay, uh, why are you asking me? I'm a securities lawyer. He says, well, you're a lawyer. You should tell me about the IP. He actually bought it. He didn't know what he was getting in terms of legal rights. That's the first problem. Second problem is if there is a mismatch between 
the token and the actual owner. Let's say somebody token, uh, uh, tokenizes a piece of IP and that he or she has no real rights to. You have a mismatch between what the government says is the legal owner and somebody who might be um, pur purporting to be the owner. Okay, so that's a problem there too. Finally, even without a registered IP, a government registered IP like a patent or a trademark, you have the problem of multiple owners. Uh, multiple owners. It, this is particularly true in copyright, okay? And that if one owner does something without the owner, the other two owners' um, knowledge, uh, there could be a problem. For example, let's say Vince, Don, and I write a book, and I decide to tokenize the IP for the book without telling the other two. Um, how are they going to react? What kinds of problems could ensue, all right? So that's the other problem with the uh, tokenization is that you uh, you still have these legal, real-world legal issues that you cannot ignore. I mean, my own thoughts on Web 3 are, was the average person even aware of the transition from Web 1.0 to 2.0? I mean, no. They, they went about their affairs. Okay, the internet got faster. They could do more things, more applications. It's really become um, the dish du jour. It's become a buzzword of our times. It's in vogue. It gets headlines. And so people seem to throw it around, even, even policymakers, and in some cases, even regulators and lawyers who probably should, should know better. Um, I want to turn to CBDCs, which, you know, I mean, I, I can see the policy rationale for that. But why stable coins? I mean, who. Who, see, who, who stands to benefit from stable coins other than, other than the issuers? Um, thank you. And just coming back to what you said, I think uh, that's a very important point. There always must be a very clear use case. So you just elaborated that the, the famous man on the street, or rather woman on the street, wouldn't necessarily differentiate between Web 2.0 or 2.5 or whatever it is. Like you said, they just realized it's bit faster and we couldn't do a few more things. And that, that holds for anything. That holds for tokenization of something. And, and we'll, I have a few examples a, a bit later. But um, w when you tokenize something, whatever the asset below it, underneath it is, you, m you must provide a very good use case of why you do so and what the advantages and benefits are over just trading the actual underlying asset. So to your question of stable coins, of course, we need to go back a little bit um, why they were created. One of the promises of cryptocurrencies was the, that it would be a unit of account and a medium of exchange. That's a bit problematic if you want to buy a house in a different country and while the transfer of the cryptocurrency you use is happening, the value of said cryptocurrency goes up or goes down by, let's say, 10%, and that's not very beneficial. Um, so they were created to have the promises of cryptocurrencies without the disadvantages. Um, additionally, a trader might park their assets in a stable coin if they expect the market to go down and they're not going to go outright short. Um, and additionally, some a little bit more obscure alternative coins can only be traded on platforms that accept stable coins uh, because they cannot deal in, in fiat. There are three different, main, mainly three different types of um, stable coins. Um, those backed by a single fiat currency, usually the US dollar, um, backed by a basket of assets and backed by an usually arbitrage algorithm. Um, since the um, fiasco of Libra and Diem and the Terra Luna collapse, I would put out that number two and number three are dead. So we're probably only talking about those um, that are backed by a single fiat currency. Now, to me, it always sounded absolutely farcical that we have an asset class that from its creation talked about disintermediation. It talked about decentralization. One of the advantages of cryptocurrencies is put out that it, uh, there's no central bank involved that can move the interest rate or can move the monetary supply, that in this asset class, we're suddenly trusting to the tune of 80 billion US dollars, um, a private company of 
rather strange individuals in some cases without ever having done a full audit by a reputable audit firm. Um, there are obvious questions around the stability of the assets, um, the ways these stable coins are created, backed, um, and as you put it out, CBDCs are coming, for sure. Um, several years ago, I talked to the respective department head of, of the German Federal Bank, and he said, um, it's coming. It's very, very complex when you go to a very detailed level. So the Swedish Riksbank was one of the first ones in the European area. They came out, made a lot of bold statements, and suddenly went very quiet. And that was exactly when they hit the level of the details they had to solve. Um, he also said central banks have exactly one shot at this. They can't get it wrong. So this is why it's quite slow. But it's going to come for sure. Um, and when it comes, when CBDCs come, stable coins will need to provide a very clear value add. Brings us back to the use case, the value add. Um, obviously, Hong Kong has come out and has said they, uh, there will be a regulation, there will be a regulatory regime for stable coins. Um, this is um, targeted for next year, 2024. Um, Yesterday was the first time Bloomberg hosted its global regulatory forum in Hong Kong. It's previously all, uh, always been done in London and New York. Um, and Eddie Yue of the HKMA reinforced that they are working on the stablecoin regulatory regime um, and that it's going to come out and they want to grow the market. So what are they going to look at? Um, they will look at a comprehensive regulatory framework. They will certainly make sure that any stablecoin issued in Hong Kong will be fully backed um, by, by respective fiat assets. Um, there will always be redemption at par. Um, there will be certain business restrictions. So for example, a wallet operator engaging in, in uh, stablecoins will not be able to, to engage in lending activities, so just separation of duties and separation of businesses. So um, it's going to come. There will be a regulatory regime. The SFC also is working on something. So, uh, and this is one of the strengths of Hong Kong right now that the regulators are working together um, when it comes to virtual assets, when it comes to stable coins, and it's certainly not something that can be said of other jurisdictions. So, Hong Kong again uh, is really at least ten steps ahead. Um, which brings us back to the question of the value add. And we've certainly seen a, a couple of proposals, and people have come to us and asked for, for help or support or guidance and, and uh, advice. And you can do that on a governance perspective, on a control perspective, on a technology perspective. And at some point, the question in my mind is, why? <laughs> what do I gain or what can you offer me? We can tailor the perfect solution and once, once the regime comes out, you certainly can create a product that will fall under the regime and after lengthy process will be um, uh, licensed and, and approved. But the question is, what's the value add? And I haven't figured that one out. If someone in the audience has figured it out, I'd be happy to talk to you. But to be, to be very honest, um, I, I, given that CBDCs are going to come, and given that CBDCs have the full backing of the respective govern, government, and as long as CBDCs can be used for cross-border payment, which is one of the main use cases, how much does it cost um, help us working in Hong Kong, not making huge amounts of money, how much does it cost them to transfer remit money back to their families in their respective countries. If we can solve for that, that's a clear use case. And if CBDCs as targeted address that use case, that's phenomenal. Brings me back to why stablecoins? I love that question. Uh, it's, uh, you know, to me, it, it, there are, obviously there are gonna be use cases for stablecoins, but I always take it back to how do, who do they compete with, right? I mean, stable coins, um, in one sense, are competing with money market funds. They're competing with um, tokenized deposits in the digital world. They're competing uh, on what basis? 
it, when a money market fund wants your money, they will try and give you the best yield that they can. You know, so that the, the person who's the ultimate beneficiary of, of that competition is the consumer who invests in the money market fund. That's not the basis that people uh, who run stable coins are competing on. You know, they, they, they basically, there's, there's a small handful of them, there are really only two. Uh, one of them, as you mentioned, um, we really can't get a clean audit of. We don't really know much about how it works, even though there's been a lot written about it. Um, and you know, it, there's a tremendous amount of yield. I mean, we know how they generate their, their, their profit. They, you know, they, they charge a fee for use, uh, they charge, and they, they hold your money and they invest it and they keep whatever spread they want to, just enough to, you know, to, to make it look like they're paying something through. But really, not, nothing that competes with even a, a straight d deposit at a bank. So the other, I think the other advantage that they purport to offer is um, transportability. Uh, like you talked about the idea of, of being able to move money in between different parts of the, of, of the digital ecosystem. Honestly, there's no reason I can't do that with fiat. And when I look at foreign exchange trading, you know, the state of the art in foreign exchange trading right now is also atomic settlement. Done on distributed ledgers, no digital asset involved. It's, you know, so there's really no need to tokenize that. I can, I, you can be HSBC, I can be JP Morgan, we can trade dollar yen and both of us can be, you know, put that money back in the market before the window closes at three. There's no need for us to, you know, to, to tokenize anything. We don't even need smart contracts for settlement, although we might be using something that in advanced, um, and there's some really cool tech out there that, that uh, does advanced uh, reconciliations and, and, you know, and, and predicts all kinds of liabilities and so on um, across asset classes for banks. That none of that involves tokenization. But it's interesting, going back to stable coins, who benefits? And it's not the consumer. And, that, and I think until, until they, they really start offering that kind of, of, you know, uh, of competition, um, then I, I think it's gonna stay that way. It's a, it's a series of small monopolies right now. Uh, and that'll change, it will change. I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to sound totally negative, but right now, there's no reason that I need to own a stable coin unless I'm selling one of the one of the, the cryptocurrencies that I hold. And even then, I'm only going to hold it long enough to sell that stable coin and bring it back to dollars. I closed a wallet on one of the, the, the exchanges that I'm no longer using the other day. I had, I don't know, something like a quarter of an ETH or something left in it. And it the amount of money that it cost me to do the trade into the stable coin, to close the wallet, to get it out into... Um, I actually just moved it to another another wallet. I moved it. I moved it to my uh, uh, to a different wallet. It cost me seventy dollars, you know. And and this is one of the major exchanges, you know. And, and and that you know, like that's that's crazy. I mean, I send. We were talking. You were talking about transactions value. Um, I send money to the Philippines every month, you know, to to support a project I have there. It costs me nothing. I send money across town on pay me every day. It costs me nothing. I, you know, I, I have to make payments in the U.S. Um, out of my, my various accounts. It costs me nothing. It's free. You know, and, and you know, it, it may cost my bank or something, but I don't have to go through the process of converting to a stable coin or out of a crypto or into a stable and going, th and going through that nightmare. The dream will happen, you know, but, but we are so far down the track, away from anything close to it. It's, it's unbelievable right now. I guess the... Uh the question of the utility of tokens and uh, should everything be tokenized is a weighty one, and it's not—it's one that hasn't uh, been fully definitively uh, answered. I mean, it seems to me that for a lot of applications, it doesn't appear blockchains needed, and uh, the world seems to be moving in the direction of distributed ledger technology rather than blockchain settlement. What do you see as the advantages then to? tokenization or if you can go into DLT without having to settle through blockchain or without tokenization again why, why even why even use tokens to, to, to your point about you know fiat currencies exist in the world of digital finance I mean you, you can e easily send a transfer why, why even bother is this or is this a, is this a technology in search of a problem I mean is it that's a very good second question I often ask because you often hear projects proposed and it seems it's a phenomenal solution 
looking for a problem. And, and quite often, um, having been a technologist before I became a trader, before I became a regulator, um, quite often, whenever I hear a private permission blockchain setup and being described, I ask myself, why can't I do the same with an Oracle database at magnitude speed advantage? But of course, um, tokenization is here. Of course, uh, it is not being talked about at some obscure, immature event. It is discussed at, 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 at a conference like this. Um, Institutions like IOSCO and BIS have taken note and issue research papers. Investment banks, management consultancies, and market data providers talk about it. Um, it would probably be uh, good to differentiate between a coin and a token. A coin is always native to its blockchain, and a token is usually built on top of an existing network. So the most popular example being Ethereum and the ERC-20 tokens. So you can then... Um, create fungible and non-fungible um, tokens, and, and Ron already mentioned um, the NFT craze. Um, in February of this year, was sort of like the high with a transaction volume of 1.73 billion US dollars. That's come down to 284 million. That's a decline of over 83%. So that craze seems to be over. Um, like you mentioned before, a lot of people, and even reported in quite reputable media, was that uh, an NFT, a non-fungible token, is a digital representation of something being art, being whiskey, being something. Um, that is not true. So an NFT is, is a link often to a website, and the website might host a picture. And most people can actually download that picture without any problem, with, certainly without owning the NFT. And there was this famous, uh, one, one was the, painting you, you described, the other one was the first tweet that ever was sent out, and there was an NFT that was sold for a couple million US dollars, and uh, the description in the Wall Street Journal said, and the owner of the NFT now controls this tweet until the creator decides to delete the tweet. So that means, as the owner, you own actually nothing. Um, Today, the market has also moved away, I think, a bit from the tokenization of real-world assets. There are a lot of very, very interesting uh, use cases, but they need a lot of hard work to figure them out. Um, something that now people look at are much simpler products, for example, treasury bills. Um, now, with the nominal interest rates at about, round about 5%, let's not discuss about um, exactly how much they are, um, th these become much more interesting. Um, the infrastructure and especially um, the legal concerns remain core challenges. Um, we have been involved in the attempt to create something, and you mentioned earlier on um, State Street and, and where you custody the, the bonds or bills that, the, that you want to create. Um, that's not straightforward. You talk about redemption fees, you talk about management fees, you talk about subscription fees. Um, someone needs to hold the underlying asset, and when you create the token and sell the token, you suddenly have a position. And you can double the cost of, of, of holding the asset and the token. And, it, that's, that's and, and that's another point. Um, you need to create a clear value add of having the token rather than buying the underlying, right? So if you buy and hold, you might as well just go to your prime broker and say, I want 500 bucks of T-bills. Um, th there are use cases for companies that have a lot of balance sheet fluctuations. So insurance companies are one. Um, logistics companies are another that have, uh, on a daily basis, they might get um, um, a transfer insurance companies char charge their fees, so their balance sheet is quite large. Um, they usually know when they have to pay out certain fees or charges, um, and they might need flexibility in how they manage that balance sheet. So being able to have a 24-7 mark, tokenized market that produces a certain yield is quite interesting to them. Um, logistics companies are quite similar. Um, so I'm not saying this, this area is dead. It's highly, highly interesting, and a lot of people are looking at it. Um, 
And when you go deeper and deeper what you need to do, it becomes very, very complex. It's far from straightforward. And like you said, like you need to pass through the yield, but as the originator, you need to make money. The distribution intermediaries need to make money. You don't want to be in a position where suddenly you run a position because you're not supposed to run a position. You're supposed to create this straight through, right? You're not supposed to be holding, let's assume, um, because of some structural deficit, you end up holding a large proportion of T-bills overnight and interest rates go up. Suddenly you're running a massive loss, which you're not supposed to. So um, it's, it's very interesting. It's going to be one of the most exciting areas to be in, and it's not trivial at all. Oh, the, I was going to say the tokenization of uh, any kind of asset um, I think a lot of people have tokenized everything without necessarily understanding why they're tokenizing anything. Um, that's probably why the NFT market collapsed. But I mean, there, there are use cases that are legitimate. For example, if you are tokenizing IP that's in the form of a digital file, that makes sense because not only can you uniquely identify the file, but you can also detect tampering because anytime you make a change to the file, however small, the, to uh, the, the hash, underlying hash will change as a result. But, that's, um, but people don't necessarily understand this is a fairly specific use case, not um, something that applies to all kinds of assets in general. Vince? Oh, I, I have, I mean, I, I, I know I've sounded kind of cynical in some of the comments previously, but there, there are some really exciting use cases right now. And I have a couple that are, are really my favorites. And you don't really have to look very far. Um, you know, across the border, when they, they start, they, you know, kind of slowed speculation to a crawl um, and then stopped mining and all that, all that horsepower, all that intellectual horsepower turned to developing uh, their internal blockchain. And it's, a, it's an asset cycle that we've seen previously when we look at derivatives markets, for instance, and the way the Chinese approached that in the middle 90s and, and uh, redirected the efforts there towards developing their own domestic exchanges. Well, they've done the same thing, you know, really in a, at, at warp speed with what they've done with their internal blockchain and what they've been able to do, for instance, with tokenizing asset-backed securities. With assembling you know, pools of, of uh, uh, asset backs or distress loans, uh, creating uh, tokens based on those, and then distributing the risk internally. And one of my favorite potential use cases, and it involves both uh, tokenization, um, it involves obviously blockchain settlement, and it involves uh, uh, using um, uh, CBDCs, would be you know, the tokenization of these, of these asset backed securities issued in offshore, perhaps in Hong Kong dollar, um, traded in a liquid market. Um, you know, the ownership and the retention would still, of course, be on the north side of the border but the, um, of, the, of the underlying assets. But very similar to the carbon market, you'd have a, a, a superimposed market that creates trice in, uh, price transparency and transfers risk. And at the same time, brings into play something the Chinese really want right now, which is creating a natural demand for CNY. You know, uh, apart from the whims of, 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 of uh, ebbs and flows of, of international investment. So very much the same uh, cycle that takes place with the issuance of U.S. Treasuries to offshore, uh, you know, uh, holders. Um, issuance of, of, of tokenized assets, uh, Chinese assets, for instance, to Hong Kong holders would create that natural demand back into CNY. And I think, so that really combines all the concepts. You have all the great things about it. You have, you have faster transaction settlement, lower operational cost, democratization of access, which is a key here. And then, um, you know, enhanced tr transparency and a more nimble architecture. Those are all the advantages that we want. And this is a use case that's crying out for it. But fractionalizing a stock, you don't need to do that with a token. You can do it right now at, at, at any broker. You know, so it's like that. I think we need to be judicious in the cases that we really look for and find things that, that really draw on all of the aspects of tokenization. Um, in five years, the conversation will be different. Everybody will have invested in tokenized architecture. We'll all be talking about tokenizing the world because I believe that's coming. But it isn't today. You know, it's, I, I lost a bet with my old boss, Travis Schwab, that we'd already be there. You know, and when we had this conversation five years previously, um, but five years hence, I think I would win that bet. 
this time. Yeah. Vince, if I may just add quickly, um, the whole uh, notion you s spoke about with China and the blockchain and what they're doing, that also is a um, infrastructure to uh, facilitate the transfer of technology amongst players. So using the token as a means of transferring technology and then backing up with um, CBDCs and other um, blockchains to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to record the asset uh, transfers. Oh yeah, and you look, I mean, some of the smartest customers I've dealt with in, um, in this new wave of exchanges that are setting up here in Hong Kong um, are, are the clients that I've dealt with that I think are the, are the sharpest are the, the, the firms that are across the border that aren't necessarily setting up to compete with Binance. Like, they're diversifying a por portfolio of, of, they're basically DLT firms. They have invested a lot in blockchain patents, they've, and they've set up, uh, they've sent 20 of their smartest kids down here to set up a, a crypto exchange, um, and they followed every single rule impeccably. Good engineers, solid people, and they, you know, I know they're really smart because they buy my stuff. Um, but they, you know, they, they, you know, and then they aren't going to set up to compete with Don or to compete with with Binance or, or anybody like that. What they're really going to do is eventually sell that to, for instance, Huatai uh, or one of the other big securities firms that is not on top of the game just yet, but that needs to be. Now, one of the big, uh, without going too far, and we had this discussion before, I remember, AJ, when um, one of the big Chinese securities firms is setting up their own digital asset platform here. Uh, and you know, so they're, they're ahead of the game. They have millions of accounts, millions. Um, if you look at, at uh, what, what um, Interactive Brokers is doing with, uh, you know, with OSL, uh, they have, again, the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of accounts. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. Oh no, final comments. Well, I'm, I've had all my time. Let me give it back over to Don. And, and Tokenization is gonna come. It's gonna fundamentally change how, how we do business, how we conduct finance. It will create new areas of finance. It's incredibly complex to do well. And Hong Kong will lead the way in how to do it on an institutional manner. Uh, tokenization has legitimate use cases, but it, that depends on your understanding of the underlying asset and the, a realistic uh, perspective on the application of the technology. Yeah, I think, like I said, um, I, I bet my old boss that uh, within five years, everything would be tokenized. This was five years ago. Um, if I made the same bet today, uh, I think I would have a better chance at winning it. Uh, because I, I think we are heading in that direction. But I think we need to be judicious about where we apply the technology, where it can do the most good, not where it's simply replicating an existing infrastructure and creating additional costs. Gentlemen, you've given us an, an informative and insightful session. Plenty to think about. Uh, I think we're already at the 130 mark, if not past it. Uh, are there any quick questions in the audience? Uh, one, one thought about the stable coins that we didn't mention is fiscal policy. Um, I, I feel like there's, there's already some very interesting use cases. And the example maybe I would, to make this more real life, is maybe if um, during the pandemic, uh, the distributions that were made by uh, the US government were tokenized and built for specific use cases, we wouldn't have had an NFT craze. Um, so I guess you know, that, that may be one use case. I know you're asking, maybe I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on um, monetary or fiscal policy. Yeah, it, it, it's a very, very good use case. Um, can be generalized to s limiting certain currency to certain people and usages. So, for example, you could say parents giving pocket money to their children and they can't spend it on sweets, alcohol, tobacco, something like that. So you can you can easily generalize that to any example you want. The danger you then have is you limit the liquidity and you limit the fungibility because suddenly my coin is different to your coin. And again, that, that's one of the reasons why central banks have to be so careful. Surely you could replicate that with stable coins, but I think, let's say, and it's gonna take 
let's assume the regime comes out next year. Let's assume an application process takes at least a year, if not more. We're looking at 2025 or later for a Hong Kong licensed stable coin um, that is fully backed, that is fully audited. That could create that, but I don't see it at the current state of affairs. I don't see it with the current um, available options in the market. I would, I would only add to that that the reason that um, central banks, and in particular central banks like HKMA, are so judicious and cautious about this is that they need to maintain absolute control over two things. The total supply of money, which is obviously uh, linked to the level of inflation, and then capital controls moving money cross-border. Um, so they need that, that, that's the reason they're being so cautious about it. And it's also the reason that most of these stable coins aren't regulated in any jurisdiction, is that you, you won't find a central bank that will give purchase to the idea of, gee, I'll let go of control of my money supply, or I will allow you to uh, move money across borders without asking any questions in terms of AML uh, and, and the like. And Stephen, if I might add one last point, um, since you mentioned the NFT craze, that was also due to uh, social me uh, social hysteria, okay, which is something a regulator regulator like the SFC would not be able to control. Thanks, guys.